everybody. Welcome to Huddle Time. It's Monday and uh, I'm your host, Ronit Enos. I hope you guys are really doing great and you're enjoying some summer. I know the Northeast had a little challenge with uh, really having a great sunny days. Hey, but you know what? You can get into an Airstream and you can start traveling someplace for one weekend, for one week. I've been doing it for one year with my husband and we're almost celebrating a year. So we are broadcasting right now from Washington State at Bellingham. Beautiful here, great place to come and visit and, and make it all the way up to the north. So hello, everybody. I just wanted to say hello to everybody. You know, sometimes I can read through Facebook who is, who is saying hi, and sometimes I can. Depends on where you're coming in. But if you're coming in and uh, you, you have not yet to hear about huddle time huddle time is uh um our regular show for about a year we've been coming in every week on facebook on uh, americans beauty show americans beauty show are our sponsors and so is textel um textel and salon cadence textel it helps engage with your customers the way they want to with easy convenient text messaging resulting in a higher revenue Simplified operation and conversation worthy of 21 centuries for sure. And even create a landing page so you can uh, track your conversation. So if you have not yet to have conversations through text messaging, that is the new way to do it. So go for it. And thank you for America's Vision for being our host and uh, as for being our sponsors and being our host many times. You know, if you have not yet, to get your memberships with Americans Beauty Show. What are you waiting for? Seriously, what are you waiting for? The roster of education and deals and retail, and not to mention Americans Beauty Show, Beauty Show is coming up in September. You wanna get a membership. This year is really, really unique and very special. It's much more intimate. It's all about education. It's all about business, technology, what's coming new, what you need to know in this new decade that we're living in. So you want to buy your ticket. Um, again, everybody, hello from Ronit. And if you're not 100% sure, who am I? I am the host and I'm a prophet and business Jedi. I'm the founder of Salon Cadence Academy. Um, we are a white glove teaching and training company for the beauty industry, elevating and scaling your career, scaling your business. A year ago, we decided in order to um, uh, navigate through weird times to start this show, and we bring to you every week, we bring to you some really great guests, experts, resiliency, um, career changers, game changers, anything you need to know or anything you want to experience, great stories that will uplift you, impact everybody's in one way or another, and help you elevate uh, your career or your business. Today, I have a very unique guest. I'm actually, every time that I uh, prepare myself for a guest, I read, I meet, I converse, I tax, I do a lot of really great uh, research. And this time I read some magnificent story about Danny Amore. I'm super excited to have him. And you know what? We have not yet to meet face to face until five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago. And already I'm in love. I'm in love with Danny Amore. I mean, is that funny, Amore? I'm in love with you. Well, welcome, Danny, to our uh, show. Hi there. Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? Doing great, Danny. I was going to introduce you uh, with all your accolade, but I figured, look behind you. Look at all all this. <laughs> this is just not just a wall. I, by the way, I just saw the whole wall, and it's so impressive, and I read so much about you. But I figured, you know what? Probably so many people know you, but what I really want to for you, I, I want to tell your story. I want to tell the story to the world because I think it's pretty extraordinary. And we just before we talked, we said uh, that you started at 2001, your first salon. Yeah. But you actually start cutting hair at 94. Yeah. So 
No, so so I'm what is older than everybody thinks? Yeah, I was going to say that you start at five. You probably started at five, but you know. <laughs> These grays are real. <laughs> funny, funny story. How <laughs> you look great. You know, actually, last time I saw uh, some images, it was long, long beard, and everybody used to call you the beard, and now they call you energy. So what? Why? Tell me, <laughs> where does this all come from? There's the energy. There's the beard. What's going on? Well. The energy's always been here with the beard or without the beard. The energy's not going anywhere. And if you guys are going to watch this for the next hour, trust me, you're going to get all of it. Now, the beard changed due to COVID and wearing masks. My beard was long and I was tired of having a scoop of my beard. When I take the mask off, it looked like I could put spaghetti inside of it because it was creating that look. And I literally chopped it off three different times during COVID. I grew it for six months. I chopped it originally. Like I even have something on uh, my Instagram live where it was like I was cutting my finger off when I took it off. Like it hurt <laughs> my heart, but I just had to, I couldn't take it anymore. So I chopped it off, let it grow for six months, chopped it off, let it grow for six months. And I literally just had it out again. And I just took the sides down because my tattoo artist had to tattoo my neck. So I had to give him some room. <laughs> but other than that, it's coming back. So the energy is always here and the beard is coming back. So. Now, not to mention, you told me that you always uh, wear your glasses. And yeah. so, for, well, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, how you cannot work with glasses and you have your mask on. Yeah, the, these times definitely made me alter a lot of things and even made me alter my look. You know, like everybody knew me as the big beard guy. I used to have a long curly mustache, always wore glasses. And due to the mask, it made me chop my beard, take my mustache off, take my glasses off. And I'm getting people like, Danny, you look younger since you cut your beard. You look younger since you took your glasses off. You look different. And I always, if you follow me for the last 20 years, I always try to change my look because I like to do things like that. You know, we're That's in cool. the look industry. So mm -hmm. people like even now, I dyed my hair blonde. Like it just, I had some extra. I was dying one of my clients the other day. Why not? You know, it just works. Yeah. So, <laughs> being different works. I know. I was looking at that shadow and I'm thinking, is this bald or is this blonde? No, it's blonde. And it's it's like just really low. Blonde. But I, it was so low and I had the extra bleach sitting around. I said, hey, why not? Like, it's nice out. It's summer. It gives some character. <laughs> so, I, and I think you have a lot of that. Danny, tell me where you started. Where are you from? Well, my ethnicity, I'm Portuguese. My mom and my father grew up in Portugal. They migrated here back in the uh, late 70s. I was born in Pennsylvania in 1980. I moved to New Jersey in 1983. I've been in New Jersey all my life. Um, as we spoke earlier, but I don't know, some people know my story, some don't. I started cutting hair at the age of 14 because I just needed a haircut and I was tired of walking around with a helmet on my head. And I never thought it could be what it is today. I never thought I could being on a Facebook Live talking about my story, my history with a plaque behind me, you know? like. When you talk about being a barber now, it's very different. Social media gave us a platform and gave us an accolade where people respect us a little more. But yeah. when I first started cutting hair or even 10 years into cutting hair, owning three businesses, 30 employees, I meet someone, what do you do for a living? I'm a barber. <laughs> You're a barber? What are you laughing at? I hold my head high. I make more than doctors make. I live, I work for myself. I've been independent since I was 21. What are you laughing at? You're still paying back your college tuition and you're 40. I'm 21 <laughs> and now own my own business. Like, you know, so it's just yeah. so unfortunate that people have looked at our industry, even as barbers and kind of belittled it. But Instagram and Facebook and YouTube has helped us put it on a pedestal where now kids growing up want to be barbers. My nephews, my son, certain people have now looked at our careers as a profession other than a hustle or a hobby or just something you did for fun, which how I originally started. Yeah. And, and now that I'm thinking about it, it's, um, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, when somebody, it's funny, you know, when, when I was a stylist or I'm still in the stylist, so first I'm a stylist, but when I was practicing here, I haven't done that for a whole year since the beginning of pandemic. Um, it's funny, I always was so proud of, of being a stylist or uh, owning a salon, but I always felt the same thing. I felt like people were not 100% embracing, uh, oh, what are you doing? Well. You know, I, I own a business. So what kind of a business? I, I own a salon and a spa. 
oh, great, where? And it was always a little dip in the voice, you know, like, hey, where, what, you know? And but yet they I, can't do anything in their life without you. They won't get married without you. They won't take family pictures yeah, without not, you. They don't want to go out on a date without you, but yet they want to be liberal how important you are. COVID made them realize how important we are. Because I had people calling me going crazy. D, I need a haircut. I'm closed, my man. I'm closed. You know, and not, it either made people appreciate it or just not understand that they could go two months without a haircut. And guys are walking around looking crazy now. Not to mention the fact that you're the, the very first one who is going to write a check or, or create a whole cataton and just donate as much as you can. I think we're the biggest philanthropist are yeah. there. So probably, you know, combined, we donate millions of dollars to so many foundation, you know, so I, I, I'm with you. But now, you know, now we all we all pass that. So who cares? Right? Yeah, like I said, like, that, that actually fuels my fire. You know, that makes yeah. me go harder, that makes me grow more. And just keep paying attention, keep watching. First, they ask you why you did it, then they ask you how you did it. Now, Danny, tell me, tell me about um, the difference between Barber World, you know, 10 years from now or 10 years ago and and now. What is the difference in your opinion? Um, That's a good I mean, I know, I know it's been growing and I know it's been getting a lot more accolades. But what are the real true differences then and now? The biggest difference now is the opportunity and how easy it is to market. When I started cutting hair, it was guerrilla marketing. It was a business card. It was a flyer. It was a handshake. It was personable. We now have transformed into a world where people have become socially awkward because everything is virtual. No one speaks anymore. They text, they email. You call them, they don't pick up, they text you right back. So that has created a little bit of a separation when it comes to communication, but also everything is virtual. So they have Instagram, they have Facebook, they have YouTube, they have apps. They have ways of people reaching you other than a payphone, a beeper, and a landline. That's the era I grew up with. Yeah. A beeper, yeah. a land. I didn't have a cell phone. There was no cell phone. Most, pe most people don't even know what beeper is. Those kids exactly. don't ever. Yeah. And funny part of my story in 2001, I was working in a barbershop already for three years, and I hated the way they answered the phones in the barbershop. 80% of the time, it was for me. So when the phone was constantly ringing for me, what would happen was a lot of the barbers would pick up and either say, oh, he's busy right now, call him back later, and I'm watching it happen. They either say he's not in the room, and I'm right there, or they're just extremely rude. And I've always been a professionalism guy, and customer service is huge comparable to a haircut if your customer service sucks and you give great haircuts you're going to be a slow barber it just but if your customer service is great and you're an okay barber you're going to be a busy barber and that's an important <laughs> asset right there so what i did was i went up to the shop owner and i asked him what it would cost me to have a landline in his shop he looked at me like i had three heads like what do you want i want my own landline in your shop i want my own phone number i want my own phone on the wall so your barbers don't have to answer the phone for me anymore. I was renting a chair from him. So I had my own shop in his shop at the age of 21. That was the mindset I already had because I would not. I refused to let the way he ran his business and the way these barbers acted every day limit the amount of money I could make, limit my customer service, and limit my value. And that's what made me go out six months later, open my own shop. And that phone number, that landline, I still have it. 908-659-9795. Call it right now. There's 10 bucks. Yeah, I actually read that in, in the in the blogs that, that was written uh, about you, about that uh, about that line, which I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant. It's like your brand and you're branding with a phone. So, um, you know, that's that's a great tool or, or even a nugget to, for everybody to keep your phone number, um, you know, have direct communication. So, But it's not uh, even just keeping your phone number. It's understanding of, I own three shops. Personalization. The chairs in my barbershops. All over America, we run barbershops differently. A lot of people work on percentage. They work a commission. But there's tons of barbershops that work on chair rentals. Right. So when there are chair rentals, 
there's an entitlement at times, and I've seen it happen for years, where yeah. you're renting a chair, you claim to be your own boss, you claim to have your own business, but you want the shop owner to make flyers, make business cards, and market you. No, that's not the shop owner's job. It's not the shop's job. It's your job. So what I did, I refused to let my chair not spin. I got my own phone number. I got my own business cards. I got my own flyers. I rent a chair. I am my own business. Very yeah. different than these guys that rent a chair and think the business owner is still supposed to do everything. Right. But yet, when they go get a car, they need the owner to write a letter stating you work here. But they claim to be independent or on their own. It don't work. Or, like or <laughs> absolutely. Just the same, same like everything else, you know, your responsibility to Uncle Sam. Are you yes. going to do it? You're not going to do it, yeah, right? Exactly. So, but but knowing being being through this this journey of twenty years of seeing the the waves in the barber world, um, and we talked about it before. I told you about uh, one of our clients who who has his dream was to open multiple locations uh, of barber shops. You know, when I think about barber shops, or when I think about um, you know, the finest of the finest. I don't know what it is, but I, I, I look at three different ways. One, I look at is the old Italian way, you know, the classic, the, the heavy wood, uh, the shave, uh, you know, the, whole, the old times, um, you know, maybe manly screens, maybe shoe shining. Yeah. I don't know. I just yeah. think yeah. about it like it's yeah. so romantic to me. And then, and then I'm thinking about like really cool, urban-y, um, you know, artistic, yeah. uh, you know, very edgy, you know, just like kind of like, like I have a really good style. Those are the only two barber's visions that I have, um, you know, and then I'm thinking to myself as being the prophet Jedi, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is really cool. It's beautiful. I love it. But we're here to make money and we're here to be prof profitable and we need to make sure that what we promise we deliver. But I find it no matter what and no matter how many waves and shift, barbers, shops and barbers still don't know how to preserve cash and how to multiply it. What's going on? How do we do it? <laughs> and how do we, how do we elevate? How do we go there? All right, the problem is cash burns a hole in people's pockets. And I tell all the barbers, anyone that deals with cash, they have to learn how to control it. I literally just did a class in Arkansas a month ago. So I asked the crowd, guys, are you renting chairs or are you paying commission? So a couple of them said they were renting chairs. So round number, what do you pay? $200 a week. So you pay your boss $200 every single week, right? Yeah. 52 weeks in a year, what does that come out to? $10,400? Do you pay yourself $200 every week? No. So you pay your boss before you pay yourself? I don't know who's watching, but barbers make a lot of money. A lot. But another big round number, $1,000. If you worked a regular job and your check said 1000 that's gross pay, not net pay. What right. Take home is maybe six hundred and twenty dollars if you're lucky. So right. almost four hundred dollars has to go to IRAs, Social Security, taxes, and other benefits you're creating for your future. Barbers take the thousand, put it in their pocket, blow it all week, and next week they have no idea where it all went. That's the problem. So now if you can pay me $200 a week and I can income $10,400 a year off of you, how do you not have at least $10,000 in your account at the end of every single year? And I'm talking a very small number, which is $200. Right. Times five, 50,000. Times 10, a hundred thousand dollars in your savings account. That's only two hundred dollars cash. Barbers make that on a Tuesday, but they're blowing it by Wednesday. That's the problem. So they they literally pay everybody else but themselves. But themselves. They don't they don't pay Uncle Sam, they don't pay themselves, and um 
what are they doing with all that cash? I mean, literally. They own a whole lot of sneakers. They got a bunch of video games. They probably got cars they, they're posting on Instagram. They're going on vacations they don't belong on. They have more kids than they can afford. Their responsibilities and their work ethic do not match. I own a lot of sneakers, <laughs> but I own a lot of property too. I have a property to pull my sneakers in. If you own more sneakers than your property value and you're renting a storage space to put your shoes in, it's called balling backwards. That's what we call it. That's not an investment. You're wasting no. money off of an accolade that means absolutely nothing. What are you leaving okay. for your children? What are you leaving for yourself? Or perfect example, COVID just happened. Right. Barbers cutting hair in their kitchen week one because they don't have savings. So I didn't then, two months. I, and, I didn't start cutting after two months because I needed money. I cut hair after two months because my clients were harassing me that they needed right. hair. Right. Oh, of course. Of course. Um, let's go back to a little bit to what you said. Um, now, you figured that out, but I'm sure it took you a while to figure that whole yeah, thing really, out. I really didn't. I had that so how, here so at a young what, age. Okay. So let's talk about that. Um, how did you decide that you can be profitable? What did you do in order to understand, you know, the numbers? I mean, what did you, what, did you have a goal? Did you did you have a certain amount of goal that you wanted to make? Uh, what was your drive? What were your driver? What was your purpose of? I mean, we're talking about a few years behind, just a couple of years before you knew you wanted to now speak your knowledge and give the gift that you have, but then you want it to be successful. What was success then for you? I gotta say it was a, a impactful time in my life that was dramatic and it sucked and it still bothers me, but it made me the man I am today. I was 15 years old, the youngest of three and I lost my father. And my father was my dad. It's like anybody's father. You look up to them like they're the best, strongest person in the world, no matter how much money they have. But one thing about my father was my father was a great person, but wasn't good with money. And when he passed away, I was 15. He left us with nothing. So now I saw my mom have to struggle with three kids she couldn't financially take care of. So my father passed away February of 95. I had a job by June of 95, and I was only 15. So I refused to let my mom struggle. I refused to struggle. And that was not the life I wanted to follow. They say traits are there, but they're meant to be broken. And a lot of people follow the way they were brought up or the way they were raised. But either you live and you learn or you follow the, the, the recipe. That wasn't the recipe for me. I changed it, you know, and I'm a totally different person because of that. And at the age of 20, 21, I was financially very, very stable. And I have an older brother, and I know he's not watching this, so I can talk about this right now, but I had an older <laughs> brother that was five years older than me that lived in my mom's basement. And I had way more money than he ever thought I had. And he saw me counting it in my house. He's like, what are you doing with all that money? I said, I've saved this. I didn't drive for a year. I've been cutting hair for three years. I don't spend any money. I don't go out. I have a like a number system. If I make $212 when I come home, $200 goes in my box, $12 goes in my pocket. If I make $307, I have $7 in my pocket, I have $300 in my box. If you have $300 in your pocket, you're gonna spend $50 for lunch. If you have $7 in your pocket, you're gonna buy a $2 protein bar and a protein shake. If you don't have it, you won't spend it. If you got it, you'll spend it. Don't sure. keep it, put it away. Put it away, you, don't see, you won't touch it, it will accumulate. Yeah. That's the temptation that we have. It's like um, it's like having a big plate of food or a small plate of food. If you have and a if small you have a plate, plate of food, you feel you're gonna eat it all. Right. Just fill your small plate. It'll yeah. be still fulfilling, and you have more food in the fridge to eat later. Right. So, um, how did you make it on from your first barber shop? You decided you want to open a second one. Why? Why isn't that one enough? <laughs> There's never enough. And like I said, opportunities <laughs> knock at times. So we spoke earlier and I had a guy that I worked for for three years and I was very comfortable, very comfortable, had my own phone line, had my own chair. I was in the corner. It was like my own shop in the shop. 
And I remember my wife at the time was like, um, you see yourself open up a barbershop? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm comfortable. This was literally August of 2001. Now the shop owner had a very small shop, his second shop, four chairs, small space on the highway. And he saw a building he wanted to buy. So he offered me that shop for a very affordable price. And one thing I did have was money. <laughs> so the money wasn't the problem. It was the mindset of, am I ready? You know, am I ready to go out on my own? Do I want to be my yeah, own? That's mom? really, that's really scary. Cause it's like, it it's is, a real, but it isn't when you have nothing to lose because right. I'm a numbers guy. I was always great at math in school. I could have been an accountant and I still could be. So now make a long story short, the rent at the new, the, his shop was $50 more than what I was giving him every month working for him. And yeah. he wanted to give me the employee that was at the shop because it was only him and another guy. I had a Some barber right next to me, but it, yeah. exactly. So I had a barber next to me that was, I pretty much trained him under his roof. I said, listen, can I trade you? Let me take this guy. You keep that guy. He said, fine. So I was charging this guy X amount of dollars. So I was only paying maybe a hundred dollars out of my pocket the day I opened up. Terrible yeah. parking, small space. Everybody thought I was crazy. Danny, what are you doing here? This is a terrible spot. No, it's not. <laughs> this is perfect. I'm 21. This is mine. And I'm making more money than I was last week, week one. I hired another barber two months in. I was already making money, saving money on my chair with two barbers. I outgrew that place in 14 months to open up my first shop, big place. I was there for two years. Same guy. <laughs> That was buying that building was selling the building. Guess who bought it? You did. Yeah. I still have that building and I just paid it off last year. Oh, congratulations. 2005. Wow. That's amazing. No, landlord, no headaches, no nothing. That's oh. long term there. So um, a good thing, if I could take three nuggets out of that and if somebody started today, uh, what would you tell them that they definitely need to do in order to be successful, in order to achieve success, financial security, happiness in their life, not to work 24 seven. What can they do today? I mean, sacrifice, thing, yeah. save discipline, sacrifice, sacrifice, save discipline. We all work 10 hour days. We don't all have to spend a hundred dollars on dinner. You right. feel like you deserve a hundred dollar dinner. Don't get me wrong. I do at times, but I can now. I didn't do it when I was trying to save. Right. I've built to the point where now I can do these things. My business pays for the lifestyle that I deserve, that I've earned. But at the age of 21, I didn't deserve a hundred dollar dinner. I needed some chicken wings and fried rice. That was five bucks. I needed what was enough for me to reach this goal because if I didn't save, if I didn't sacrifice or have the discipline, I'd be 41 years old right now with nothing to show for it. Like still yeah. wondering how, why, chasing my tail. Like, no, I see barbers chase their tail every day and it drives me insane, but they're the last ones to walk in the shop. They take the longest lunch breaks. They always have an excuse, but they wonder why. Oh, I know why. I clearly know why. So before you make an excuse, think about how much you're sacrificing, how much you're saving, and how much discipline you really do have. Because I've been behind my chair for 23 years, and if my appointment's at 10, I'm there at 10, not at 10.45. If I have 10 people to service that day, I'm there and servicing all 10. If I have to go on vacation and come back and jump off a red eye to be there for my first client, I do that. And that's why my chair still spins 23 years later. Love it. Now, let's talk about profitability, though, okay? I know you know numbers. Let's share, let's share some really tips. You can't charge $10 to do uh, an hour haircut. It's just okay. not profitable. No, no, no. And I find it, Danny, and I find that's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is people just don't charge. The, you know, and I, and I get that don't charge my worth. I'm okay with that. But can we just put that sentence cliche out? And put down more of like, do you know what you really need to charge, and what would it be the criteria in you know to charge? But I mean, also, I hear it comes with your worth. 
I'm not paying you $50 for a haircut if my appointment is at 10 o'clock and I have to wait for you till 11. I'm not. People don't pay me only for my service, my quality. They pay me for my time management. You don't walk in my barbershop. I'm sorry, I still have two more people in front of you. Two more? How? Two more? Why? Like, I'm running late. Why are you running late? Why are you behind? Like, because you had personal things to do? You're not respecting this client. You feel as if you deserve that he owes you $50. It's impossible. Now, are you using 99 cent alcohol or $15 aftershave? Are you using water or actually some hot towel and a hot shave? Are you using quality products that you're actually educating your clients about? Or you got your headphones on and you're cutting them and sending them out the door? Very different service. Yeah. I so did that love that. Saw and gave a service to the guy. And literally, I went through the whole thing. I gave him a beard treatment. And that's what I do. So I gave him a full beard treatment. I said, in my barbershop, I would normally charge you $50 for the service. I've never seen the guy. He was one of my models. He was one of their clients. What would you pay me for this service? He said, $100 with my eyes closed. I've never had this treatment, he said. I said, hold on, say that again. It wasn't a haircut. What was it? Treatment. People pay for a treatment. And right now, barbers are slow. So before you rush that client out of your chair to get back on Instagram that you're doing nothing, why don't you give him a hot towel that costs you nothing? Why don't you give him a mini facial that you can possibly charge him in the future for? Why don't you introduce him to a product or a service for free today that eventually he might want that you could possibly charge him for? You don't because that's not your mindset. You're not disciplined. You're not worried about saving money and you're not being successful that way. So, so I'm going to I'm going to add to the list, okay? So I'm going to repeat and recap. I'm going to say you have to be disciplined, you have to save, and you have to sacrifice at least for the first few years. Yes. But you also have to learn how to give treatments and not services. Where in the few in the past we service our client whenever however we want. But this time we have to elevate um yeah, I know I know you can hear me, so I'm gonna put you down I got there. You. I got you. Uh you have to elevate 100 percent you have to elevate your treatment and not look at this as service. Now, if we had to even go deeper into that, what does it look like today in Barber World or any kind of a high-end feeling, you know, what does it mean? Like, walk me through the whole experience, the whole treatment. Well, the key is creating a service that they're not accustomed to, you know? And yeah. And also, sorry, my phone. Things about to die. I want to make I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. So, the key is, as I mentioned, you mentioned $10. It was $10 when it was a 15-minute haircut. Yes, I used to cut 25 people a day, high and tight. Boom, boom, boom. Get out of here. No aftershave. 99 cent alcohol, they just got a haircut. I don't do that anymore. I've been doing this for 20, 23 years. I refuse to service more than 20 people a day. I, I'm done with that. Yeah. I do between 10 to 13, 15 if I'm generous and I have a price point for it. I no longer do it in 15 minutes. I'm giving you, I have different price points for different times and different services. So my time ranges from 20 minutes the most it'll be is 40 minutes. I cut very fast. I know how to give an effective service in 20 minutes, but I know no one wants to pay $50, $60 for 20 minutes. So I've learned to extend that service and give them certain quality that the last guy didn't give them. That's going to lock them in. They'll always come back and they're paying me top dollar for them. Uh, 100%. And I, and I want to re enrate that. I want to re enrate that. I used to, you know, how many times did I have in my chair some amazing uh, men that hardly have any hair and I would charge for my time. I would always charge for my time. That's always been the case. And whether it was a man or a woman didn't matter. However, there's so much you can do with such a little hair. Yeah. But, but you can add a full head massage, a full rub, a full something. Sure. And make that, it make that about the treatment because at the end of the day, you want your reputation to be, oh my God, you have to go there. 
not because of anything other than the treatment. And I love that. And I'm going to keep saying the treatment because the future of, uh, of what we are dealing in right now, of how are we going to stay not just in business, but thrive in our business is about technology and about personalization. Yeah. Because now there's such a big disconnection with the personalization. I feel like now it's even more important. So people really have to be on top of that. Yeah. And so what what would you do? What would you what what do you do in your place that makes the treatment be so amazing? Like I said, I take care of every single person. I tell my barbers, I have a hot towel Tuesday. Tuesday is the slowest day in barbershops. Give everybody a hot towel. You're not that busy. Like, stop. Like, relax. It takes you no time. Grab the towel. And it costs you no money. It's costing me money. Grab the towel. Out the hot towel. Put it on the client's face. He doesn't have that facial hair. Who cares? Let him sit back. Let him relax. Let him take a nap. He's going to get up like, wow, that felt good. Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to feel good. It's something extra I gave you that I will not charge you for, that I guarantee you, you will tip me for. So before yeah. you rush him out of your chair, why don't you make an extra five, 10, 20, $50 by adding something you weren't doing prior, but they're too yeah. busy rushing the guy out of the chair to give him a $10, $15 haircut. And this is why they're balling backwards because they're not being efficient. They're just being that wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And there's no return quality that way. No. And then there's no retention. I mean, no the, people, the people even measure their data. I mean, do they even in barbershop, you've got so much data these days can to measure your retention. I mean, the people even think about that or do they work like a hamster in a hamster they wheel? Do. They do. I still hear clients walking in telling barbers, I text you. You didn't answer me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was busy. Huh? Like, That's what? ridiculous. Like, That's ridiculous. Yeah. So now but by doing what you're doing, you were able to buy many properties. You told me, tell me, tell me how you got your first one. I mean, tell me what you, what would you mean properties? How many do you have one in Costa Rica? No, nah, but I'm, I'm, I'm steering for it. Like my new goal is they say, invest in what you love. And I love to travel. So I'm trying to buy condos in every place that I enjoy to go to I'll Airbnb them. And when I'm ready to retire, I'm going to be the traveling barber and pay attention to my YouTube page. Cause everybody loves my food. So I'm going to be the new foodie guy. So you can watch those videos. But I'm, I'm actually here for that much longer. <laughs> I tell you, I'm actually thinking about buying a property in Portugal because oh, that Portugal is the is place. Yeah. Yeah. It's just Amazing. probably just so expensive everywhere now. So yeah. I got to play ball and just wait. But my first property I bought <clears throat> was my first personal home. Here, this is my home. I've owned this home since 2003. Uh, I had a small apartment, had my son at the age of 23, you know, like nice little apartment, but not enough between all my sneakers and my son and diapers <laughs> and all types of stuff. So I just refused to rent. I've been my own boss since I was 21. And I haven't put a dollar out of my pocket into my business since then. Yes. Oh, you know? wow. And I've learned that your money's supposed to pay for your assets. So yeah. when I started making the money from that, I was already busy behind my chair and I refused to rent another apartment to have nothing to show for 20 years later. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I started looking at multifamily houses and I was trying to invest in a multifamily thinking I could rent one apartment and uh, well, I'll stay in one, rent the others. But at the time I'm in Jersey, property value is so high and I didn't want to be a tenant with a family. So I decided to go out on my own and buy a one family house, got myself a mortgage and I knew what that payment was every month. And if I had to work an extra 10, 15 hours a week, I'm far from a lazy person. I did it. And I bought my own home at the age of 23. That one home I used as an asset to buy my commercial property in 2005. Then I still use the leverage from this property by my mother a house. My mother lives right up the street in her that own is house. Awesome. And I just refinanced my house last year to pay off my commercial property. So this one property, this first property has been my PowerPoint to create structure for everything else. That that is pretty amazing. I, I have to say that um, you know, 
I just, you know, it, it, I, I just wish that people would look at this experience and know that they can do it too. And I know you said you need discipline and I know you need, but, but literally we're talking about the mess. It, it's not happening. So what can we do, Danny? Uh, amore, me amore. What can we do to, to change that? Well, where do we start to change that? Because obviously there's only a few of us who do it. I would say 5% do it. The and other 95% are not. And that's the sad part because I normally have the answer to every question, but this one I don't. Because I've tried to force this into people. And like literally, this is Facebook Live. And I know you guys can feel my energy through the screen. So imagine me in your face telling you this. You see the vein popping out of my neck. That's how serious I am. <laughs> you know? Like, I do motivational classes. I do, are you a success addict? I do tons of stuff to try to inspire people. I'm not here to brag. I'm here to tell you my story because the shit is real. And it's possible. I'm a barber, remember? But I do pretty darn well for myself. And I'm very comfortable. So there's ways of doing it. But... Here's the blueprint. You follow it, fine. You don't. Like, I have barbers that work with me every day. They see I'm there before them. They see I don't take lunches. They see I don't take breaks. I show them my calculator at the end of the day to show them how much money I made to inspire them. It just doesn't sink into them all. And I compare it to a player like Kobe Bryant. Like, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, they would yell at their teammates on the court. And people thought they were assholes. They're not. They just want you to be just as great as them. But okay. you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to meet pe trying to make people great as you because they're not you. They'll never be oh. you. They'll never so, have that mindset. They'll never have that goal. Never have that discipline. So before I yeah. limit my success because I'm using that energy towards you, uh -uh. I've learned now I, I can't give everybody that energy or that talk because it drains me from my success. So I'm trying, but yeah, I'm you so know, much. I know that the today's world, a lot of people just really don't want that, Danny. They really don't want to work 24 seven to, to be there. There's, you know, they're looking for different, they value time today a little bit more than the value money. So, too, but it depends on the goal you're trying to reach. I value my time now because I got money. <laughs> but you can't value time without money because now you got tons of time and no money. So what are you doing with your time and no money? Nothing but complaining. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I think you can I, I, sacrifice a certain amount. of. I'm not saying your whole life. If you're right. running 24 seven your whole life, there's something wrong. Right. Like I said, I'm 41. I'm very, very close to retiring very soon. I don't want to work much longer. And I'm, I'm not. This is my, my testimony right here. I'm not. Good for you. Good but for I you. I did that. And I'm still doing that. And I'm still sacrificing. I'm still saving. And I'm not dumb. I know what I need to do for me to accomplish that goal. That's a whole nother goal. So I'm right. doing it right now. So everything that you discuss right here is so possible. We, we can do this. And I think, Danny, I do have a little answer. I think I know where where we can help out. I think we can help out by going to the schools and teaching the schools business and faith and all these trade that you're talking about and bring that to the surface right from the beginning and not not when they're already um, you know, already in the rabbit hole. You know, yeah, I think yeah. that's something. Uh, you know, but everybody goes through some hard times and i'm bringing on you know what we went through a year ago how did it how COVID affected you oh it got me too but what i do i turned a negative to a positive i've owned my business for 15 years i've been dying to renovate the place i couldn't renovate the way i wanted to because i couldn't close we closed wednesday i was renovating by friday i have a whole new revamped business people were struggling over money stressed over money i was reinvesting money in my property very different person but the last 20 years of my life helped me do that during covid but the last 20 years of the others lives had them cutting hair in their kitchens 
because they didn't make the proper moves. So this was a huge smack in the face to a lot of people. Certain people took it good. Certain t- people took it bad. Certain people don't care. They're going right back to the rat race. Shame on you. Well, you've been around for quite a while. You know, both of us started at 2001. And both of us went through 2008, which was a tough one as well. Um, you know, now now we got, we got hit really bad. Uh, a year ago, or we got hit really good. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, you see, we've seen some, we've seen some shifts in the industry, right? We we see a lot of salons are struggling because they lost a lot of their people. A lot of a lot of people are moving to single uh, suites. They they sweet, yeah. really want. Everybody's going to suites. Do you think that's going to last? What do you think that wave is doing right now? It's a fascinated facade. And you know why I say that? Remember my story from 2001? From day one, I hired the barber and I was no longer paying my rent. You guys are renting salon suites for $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 a month. Not counting your phone, not counting your insurance, not counting everything. You have an overhead now with no employees, with no room to put them in. If you have a suite that holds two chairs, fine. You can make a little income off one employee. After you make income from that, it's called a glass ceiling. There's no more room. So for all these self-independent suite owners, you're not making as much money as you really think you're making because there's no walk-in traffic. There's nobody advertising for you. There's no other person that they're coming to look for but you. You know how many people come into my shop looking for my lazy barbers that are not there and they sit in my chair? I cut their hair every time. And they ask me for my phone number and they come back to me every time. That's why this business has worked for years. And it's so unfortunate because I have clients now saying they go to tons of barbershops and they can't just walk in and get a haircut anymore. Yeah. They have to have an appointment. They have to book an app. What happened to walking into a regular barbershop at 10 a.m. and eight guys being in there? five guys being in there now there's one guy in there because he has appointments the other guys are home because they don't have any appointments on the app but the shop door opens at 10 a.m you're training the clients that there is no more walk-ins anymore so for all this salon suite once again when it comes to a number system you're in the negative week one you have to pay an overhead with no income coming in but you so they're going back to working 24 7 because they have to pay their mortgage at home they got to pay the salon suite rent and they got to try to give the best service possible with no walk-in traffic. Right. You're paying for your own business cards, your own flyers. You are your own boss now, but now you're in debt. And now you're in debt. Okay. So I think, I think, um, um, we both, we both looking at this as an opportunity for maybe for people to appreciate freedom in a different way. Uh, maybe maybe learn how to run a business and maybe from sweet start to own your own and kind of follow uh, your footsteps. I think I think barbers, um, the world, the future of, of barbershops. What where do you think is going to we're going to have the most um, we need to implement most change other than personal service and, and creating a treatment? It's time management, personal service and time management. You have to yeah. be there. Like, if, if you go to Walmart at nine o'clock in the morning and they are supposed to have 10 employees there, guess what? All 10 are there for $13 an hour. But now you own a salon and a barbershop with eight chairs and the doors open at 10. They're making 50 to $100 an hour and there's only two there. How does that make sense? That's just me. I love it. No, I love you making sense. Danny, tell me about tell me about you. So <laughs> you're how many how many kids? I got two kids. My son is 17, he'll be 18 this year. My daughter's 15, she'll be 16 this year. That is amazing. Are they going to be in your business? Actually, no. My son's he's a big like fitness guy. Like he plays soccer, he loves soccer, he plays for his school and for the state. Uh, he just became the captain of his team, and he wants to get into physical therapy. Like that's his thing. 
You know, yeah. My daughter, she doesn't have her niche yet, but she's a ball player too. She plays a lot of soccer, <laughs> plays basketball. So I got some some athletes in my family. And just so so we know what what feeds your energy so much. What is your day like when you start? Wait, what time do you start in the morning? Oh, I'm, I'm up wake up. Early. Yeah, I'm up early. When? I'm an early guy, and I'm 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 a workout guy. I work up every morning, five thirty six. I'm in the gym every single day. I don't care if I'm on vacation, if I had a long night, if I'm traveling, if I got a class at seven in the morning, I don't care what it is I go and I do. And that's why I keep the energy that I have because I do something active every morning. And my success out of classes, I talk about that. That's my second PowerPoint. Every successful person does something active every morning. I don't care if it's swimming, running, jogging, basketball, golf, tennis, you name it, they do it. It gets your mind going, it gets your heart going, it gets your body going and it keeps you healthy, young and energetic. And that's what gets me going. And what kind of diet do you have? What is your lifestyle? Oh, that? I try to eat as clean as possible, but I'm a food junkie. So I've learned how to balance everything. Yes, yeah. I'll have some grilled chicken and rice all day or some salad. But when I'm ready to eat some tacos, I'm eating it. If I want some churros, I'm eating it. <laughs> if I want to eat some chicken wings, I'm eating them. You know, so I travel a lot and I love food, but I've learned even that. Like, if I know I ate something bad today, guess what? I get up an extra half an hour early tomorrow and I'm on the treadmill for an extra half an hour just to build that balance so I can treat myself, you know? Where's your favorite place to travel to? Whew. Well, I got to say off the top of my head, got to be Miami. So I'll be moving to Miami soon. But Miami. Woo! Oh, I love Miami. I love Miami. But if what we do you want to talk. Where do, you, where do you go to? Where, what do you do in Miami? Where's your favorite place in Miami? Well, I've been everywhere. I'm really fond of the Wynwood. But if I move to Miami, it'll be more like North Miami. You know, yeah. a little quieter there. I'm not crazy about the beach at the moment. Yeah. Not what it used to be 20 years ago. But I just love the the, the tropical feeling. You know, it's just even yeah. that. Like, I'm an energy guy and I'm in New Jersey. And yeah. I've lived here all my life, and I'm just tired of waking up, and it's like 12 degrees outside. It's gray. It's cold. It uh, changes it's, my aura. You know, it changes my I energy. Know. Whenever I'm somewhere and I see a palm tree, it just makes me happy. It makes me energized. Like, like I said, I'm an athletic guy. I like outdoors. So Miami, I can yeah. be fit all year round. Here it gets cold. We end up eating more, gaining some weight because we put a hoodie yeah. on. Yeah, and it's it, gray. You know? It's gray. It's yeah. always gray. Yeah. July used to be such a great month. Now it's not. Now yeah, it's already no. there. Yeah, yeah. So it was real cloudy off and on. Like it was a little sunny, but it's like we get a limited summer, you know? So we try to maximize it. And that's what makes people lazy too, where June, July, and August are the only three months that we get heat. So we get a nice day. Guys want to call out of work. They don't want to come to work. They want to come in late. They want to leave early because it's nice out. But if you're somewhere where it's nice all year round, that becomes the normality. So there's not so much of a, I need a day off. Like every day is nice, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, well, I think that we pretty much were out on top of the hour. We cover so, so much. I told you we could go for hours. <laughs> no, I, I, I can sit down with you right now on a couple of tacos and I moved already to the margaritas. So for sure, for sure. Um, but I do, I do want to put it out there to everybody. Um, Danny, how can we get more of you? How can we get more inspired by you? How can we learn more from you? What's the best place and how can we reach out to you? Well, if you follow me currently, my name's at the bottom of the screen. You can find me on Facebook under Danny Amorum. Uh, you go on YouTube right now, punch in that same name. You're gonna get all my YouTube content, whether if it's on my page, the Andes page, anybody else's page. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Exotics Hair Battle Tour but I used to host the longest running ever in history, Barber Sneaker Battle. We're at City 89 in a matter of like seven or eight years. And not to brag, but I've hosted the most barber battles in the industry. No one Why? has more barber battles than me. <laughs> so when, when is the next one? My next barber mm -hmm. battle. Well, actually my, uh, my next trip, I'm working Lollapalooza, the concert. This is pretty cool about being a barber too. You know, you get all the perks. So I'm working a very big concert, Lollapalooza in Chicago. And then the next hair show I'm working will be Bronner Brothers, New Orleans, the end of August. Uh, two weeks after that, I'll be in Chicago at ABS at the American uh, Beauty Show. Make sure to check that out. I'll be at the American Beauty Show. I'm on stage at the barber stage at 1130 to 1230. And I also have the success at a class from 1230 to 130. But this is the craziest part about this, guys. And I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. 
I've been a barber for 23 years. I've worked these shows all my life. I love working them. I work for the Anders Company, as you guys all know. I've been on all these stages because of Anders Company. I work for Gibbs Grooming. I've hit all these stages because of Gibbs Grooming. American Beauty Show reached out to Danny. Not Anders, not Gibbs, Danny. They subcontracted me because they wanted me at the show. And I'm one of the very few barbers they've ever done that with. So I don't want to brag, but I'm excited and I'm humble. And it's a, a, a huge accolade for me. You see these behind me? I put these here. Like they say, if you never posted, it never happened. If you don't hang it, it won't remind you. So I love this, it. This just love like love that me. energy. Yeah. And you know what? We're going to rock it. I love that energy. And we're going to use that energy on ABS and we're going to rock the world. Oh, over there. Trust me. About it. it comes with me everywhere <laughs> I go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, guys. So anybody with this has been a little taste of Danny. And if you want to see more of Danny, if you want to see more in me, you know, you're going to get me every week here and we are going to be live in the September show. We were just live in Chicago for the first live event we just did two weeks ago, and it was amazing. So September is coming. Get your ticket and get your dancing shoes or your sneakers, and we will rock your world. Nice. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week with another great guest. Danny, hang on. Don't hang off. And one more. I didn't drop my Instagram. Danny. It, uh, Danny Amorim is my Facebook and my YouTube handle, but if you follow me on Instagram, it's Success Addict, all in word. Success That's two right. Ds and That's Addict right. Two Ds. All right, so make sure you follow me on Instagram. I have a lot of content. We, have, on. we posted all over all over the feed, so we're good there. Perfect. Thanks, Danny. You're amazing. Thank you guys. Appreciate you having me. It was fun. <laughs>